Hello, I'm Dr. Kira Kelly, and you are very welcome to Beyond Expectations. So let's talk psoriasis. This is a four part series where we aim to bring you the important and practical information that you need if you are living with psoriasis or psoriatic arthritis. And our panel of experts are going to attempt to answer the questions that you might have, the most common ones that they encounter. Today, we're going to be talking about children and psoriasis. And I am joined by Chris Mulligan, who is a, a young woman who has been living with psoriasis since the age of nine. And Fiona Lawler, who is a clinical nurse specialist and clinical nurse manager at Tala University Hospital. And Dr. Maeve McAleer, who is a consultant dermatologist at St. James's Hospital and Children's Health Ireland. You're all very welcome and thank you all for joining us today. Even though in some ways it's similar to psoriasis in adults, we know that there are distinct issues maybe around education, or around being a teenager with psoriasis or indeed transitioning to adult care. I might come to you first, Maeve, if that's OK. Um, with regard to psoriasis in children, how does it differ from psoriasis in adults and how does it present? What might somebody come across? Mm. Well, psoriasis in children, um, it's, it's a common inflammatory skin condition. It affects about 1% uh, of children, we think. Um, and so it's it's uh, it's out there, not as common as maybe atopic dermatitis, but a very common inflammatory skin condition. And it presents in some ways very similarly to adults, but there are some differences. So um, similarly to adults, you know, patients have very well demarcated plaques. Um, and when I say well demarcated, you could draw a line between the affected skin and the unaffected skin. And psoriasis likes to pick out certain areas like the elbows, the knees, the scalp, um, the body folds. Um, and uh, in some patients, there's very small parts of the body affected and other patients, they have a lot of their body affected. So there's a lot of similarities to the adult uh, disease, but there are some distinct differences. Um, psoriasis in children sometimes, um, you know, can clear up, um, can just last a few months and, and disappear. And that's less common in the adult world. Um, and then you know, in terms of uh, the appearance, it can often be much more subtle in children. So children's plaques can be a lot thinner. There's a lot less scale and that can make the diagnosis a little bit trickier in children. Um, psoriasis in babies can present as sort of troublesome nappy rash. Um, and psoriasis in, in, in children uh, can often affect the face more than in adults. So the, the presentation of the disease can vary with age. And for people who are maybe attending the GP or for GPs themselves, is it hard to tell the difference between psoriasis and things like eczema? Because eczema, as you say, is very, very common in children yeah. and they do look a little bit alike. Yeah. And, and, and does that delay the diagnosis sometimes? It can be tricky. Absolutely. Um, you know, there is one Australian study that showed that children who had psoriasis were the majority of them were initially diagnosed with atopic dermatitis. Uh, atopic dermatitis affects 20% of children in Ireland, psoriasis 1%, so the likelihood is greater. Um, but, but there are some differences um, that can help. And, and mostly your, your dermatologist will be able to tell most often by just looking at your child. So, um, you know, uh, atopic dermatitis, uh, for example, affects usually different body sites. For example, it spares the nappy area where psoriasis in a baby will often uh, affect the nappy area. Um, the inflammation in atopic dermatitis is more diffuse. It's hard to almost tell the beginning and the end of it. Whereas, as I said, in psoriasis is much more circumscribed or well-defined. And I think one of the most important differences is itch. So, I mean, that our babies and children with atopic dermatitis have intense itch and their itch is so severe that um, when they, they can't sleep at night or when you take their clothes or baby grow off, they have to scratch. Exactly. Whereas our children with psoriasis usually only have mild itch and it usually doesn't affect their sleep. So I think that's a really good indicator for for um, parents. Um, Chris, let me bring you in here. You've had it since you were nine. You're 16 now. Can you remember how you first no noticed it or what you were first experiencing? Um, so first I noticed it on my scalp and it came in big lumps and it'd be all flaky and very, very itchy. And if I scratched it, it would start to bleed and not very nice to deal with. Okay. Yeah. And, and did it stay sort of localised to the scalp or, or 
then did it, other parts of you get affected? Yeah, it would go everywhere. So it'd be on my knees, my arms, my all along here, on my scalp, on my headline as well, and my ankle as well. So anywhere really it could go to a wind. But this is the classic pattern you're talking yeah. about, Maeve, isn't it? That 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 these are the sites that you would kind yeah. of pick up on. Yeah. yeah. And did you did you know anything about psoriasis when you? No, no. I didn't know. So you just thought was. I have an itchy scalp or yeah. I'm a bit rashy or something. Yeah. So. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And did your mum know anything initially? Um, not really. She well, we both thought it was just like the knits, so we go with the knit <laughs> comb. And very common. It was, yeah, yeah totally. it was primary school as well. So we go with the knit comb yeah. and double check what it was. So I imagine the knit comb yeah. was quite yeah. sore if you had psoriasis. It, mm. Yeah, it was a bit sore and they, the combs would usually break. Oh, yeah, that's actually very hard. Yeah. Um, <laughs> this is probably a fairly familiar story to some yeah. of the people looking today okay. at this, that they would be thinking either their child has been diagnosed with psoriasis or is living with psoriasis, or maybe they're suspicious that they have psoriasis and, and they're here looking for information. So if parents have sort of seen some of these signs, that the, the rash in, in sort of specific places, that demarcation, what should they do? Where should they go for help? So usually the first protocol is their GP. Um, so usually they attend there. Hopefully their GP can give them a diagnosis and tell them there and then that it is psoriasis. As Maeve kind of like touched on, it sometimes can be hard to differentiate. So maybe if at that time they don't get a diagnosis, we would say the GP then would generally kind of send a referral then to a dermatology department. And hopefully they get in to see like a specialist at that stage. The other thing is like parents, I suppose, um, for the digital age. So I suppose a lot of them will go online and things like that. Yeah, mm. Dr. Google. Yeah. Um, so I guess, you know, if they, they know it's psoriasis, their GP has told them, it's important that they go on to like the correct kind of websites that have accurate information, like it's up to date, that they're following a reliable source, things like okay. that. Yeah. And are there good sources of information for people that, you know, they might finish watching this and then go and say, well, now I'm going to look up someplace. Where should people go to get good information? That That's, as you say, not misinformation, that's quality information. So the Irish Skin Foundation have a really, really good website. Um, they have parent information like leaflets and booklets and things like that. Um, I guess that that's a very good website. Um, the British Association of Dermatologists, things like that, they can go on to. Um, if they do come into us, like we would give them a lot of information as well. That's obviously accurate, up to date. We go through, we go give the parent information leaflets and we kind of set them on the right track on where to go. So they'll know then where, you okay, know. Okay, so, and then that really helps. You, if you feel equipped with information, doesn't that feel a little Knowledge bit more empowering? Power. Exactly. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. no one likes their child having, a, 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 I'm sure your mum didn't like you getting a diagnosis. We don't like diagnosis no. for ourselves, but yeah. particularly for our children. Maeve, we've talked a little bit about um, treatment, about people being newly diagnosed, but how does treatment differ or does it differ, the, the kind of the treatment pathway for children? Well, I mean, as you know, there are many treatment options out there and, you know, we're very lucky in psoriasis. I think we are in an age now where we can treat successfully um, and manage the disease. There's no cure, but I think it's very important that our young people, our children and young people know that we can manage this. Um, and when you consider the treatment for psoriasis, as you know, there's topical therapies, there is phototherapy and there are systemic therapies, both methotrexate or biological therapies. So there are similarities to the adult world there and, and they tend to be much better behaved than adults. <laughs> yeah, really? Fine. Oh, yeah, I think so. I think so. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, with alcohol, for example, okay. or yeah. or just generally some lifestyle choices. So yeah. alcohol, smoking, the, the, those aren't the aren't the issues maybe in, uh, yeah. we, we hope at least yeah. well, they aren't no, the issues. No, yeah, in, in, I think, in, I think, in, yeah. in no. children that they can be in adults. And I think, you know, uh, probably uh, a major issue is, is you know, you have to really carefully consider the impact on a, on a, on a child or young person, the impact of the disease. And um, we obviously do that in, in our adult patients also, but skin disease can have a really big impact on kids. And we have to very carefully consider the impact on their education, you know, their their social uh, interactions, their self-esteem, and, and even, you know, consider 
anxiety and depression in, in, in our young people. Um, and yes, those things can affect adults as well. But I think young people ha are at such a critical stage yeah. in their physical and, vulnerable, and social development. Sense. Yeah, they've so many milestones that they have to hit in those years that, you know, adults, we have an easier time. You and know, so we are you saying then that, that you would be and I don't know if you're saying, but a bit more aggressive in treating it in, in, in children to, to knock all those issues I on the head? I think so, yeah. I think you need to be very aggressive in children and young people with treatment because the impact on their development can be massive. Um, so I would be very aggressive um, in trying to control their disease. Um, and, they, and, and our young people and our children can cope really well with treatment. You know, they're a resilient bunch. Um, you look incredibly poised here and like nothing has impacted on your <laughs> development, Chris. <laughs> and, but but did it? Was it a hard road? I mean, t tell us a little bit about your treatment journey, if you don't mind. Well, for starters, we went to like the GP and they said I was allergic to cat skin. And I don't have a cat. So I had dogs, I had fish, I had hamsters and gerbils. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. They said I was allergic to cat skin. And then after that, I was referred over to Crumlin okay. to get an appointment. And we waited about a year for that because I was only nine at the time. And they instantly said it was psoriasis. I'm guessing that what we're seeing here is a GP who thought it was atopic dermatitis. Is that what that is? I that would think so. Yeah, I yeah. would think and that so, maybe. And, you know, you have to remember, um, skin diseases evolve. OK, yeah. so... Um, I yeah, think, I'm not even being critical, yeah. but, but I'm saying that the, if yeah, you're I think things that's like probably we're going down the atopic route, that family of diseases, eczema, asthma, hay fever, food allergies yeah. or airborne allergens, they were probably thinking you were atopic. Um, and sometimes, as I said, the plaques are thin in children and it's tricky at the outset. It can be. OK, so you went to the GP allergy to cats, which clearly wasn't the case. Yeah. But then anyway, Eventually, you did get to yeah. dermatology in Crumlin. And, and what would have happened then? Chris? First thing was to just like do the creams. So like they gave me different creams to try to see that would suit my skin. And it worked for a little bit, but not that much. Like it didn't really improve, improve it. And uh, my mum, because I was young, my mum would do it for me. And she would be a great help because at the time I was quite lazy and also young. <laughs> like, I think you're being a little bit <laughs> harsh on yourself. Yeah. You like were about nine. 10. Yeah, ten. yeah. But um, yeah, she would be a great help. A great help to me. And so you started with the topical treatments. And yeah. was that enough? Did that get it under control? Mm, a little bit. It did take some time. But then we decided to go to the light treatment when I was about The phototherapy. 12. Yeah. That, yeah, yeah. Was when I was 12. And that also did help for a while, but it didn't get it away. OK, didn't fully control yeah, it. Yeah, okay. didn't fully control it. And once I finished with the light treatment, it came back in a week. OK, so it didn't have any lasting impact. No. And that can be the drawback, can't it? With photo you, you can. Well, clear. that would be considered a failure of treatment. So if you yeah. have a course of phototherapy and you, you know, you attend the hospital three times a week for six to 12 weeks, we really want to see disease remission. And if you don't get disease remission for at least 12 months or longer, we would consider that a failure of phototherapy. So yeah. it didn't work for you yeah. if your disease came back in a week. And then? And then they decided we could do the tablets. Okay. So I did that when I was 14. And it was the week. So you take one tablet per day until the Saturday, which was when I took five tablets for my skin. They were horrible. Okay. I hated them. Tell me why. It was the taste of it and the size of them. I'm not great at taking tablets. Okay. I, I'd be honest, I'm not great at them. They are um, ugly. <laughs> to, like, I didn't like them at all. That's OK. <laughs> so, Unexpected. Yeah. <laughs> Unexpected just like of the ugliness of the tablets. Yes. <laughs> um, it was also quite difficult because when I take them, they dissolve in my mouth and then I gag okay. and, and they tasted yeah. terrible. So yeah. you weren't you probably weren't swallowing them quickly enough. No. Because you but lots no. of children would find it yeah. even some adults find it difficult. Yeah. So then did you move on to the No, I stayed on the tablets for two years. Okay. And when That's very very, yeah. very determined of you considering you really weren't yeah. liking them. Well yeah. Done. Um I would sometimes say that I've taken them when I haven't. 
And my mum ended up counting them oh, Lord. to make sure that I take, had taken them. You're destroying. Yeah. I'm May. sorry. You're destroying sorry. May's thing that ch children are great patients. <laughs> yeah. You know, I think this is I the honest story, though. This is what all patients do. Yeah. 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 No, I don't it think is. it's unique yeah. to no, me. Yeah. No, I don't. We're all, I, don't. We're, we're, I think so. You were, you were half great. on the tablets yeah. then at yeah. that stage. Yeah. yeah. Um, I try avoid taking them as yeah. much as possible. Okay. And did you move on? After that? I've only just moved on to the injections. Okay. And so how are you finding that? It's actually quite easy. I really? did the injection myself, yeah, because my mum pushed me to do it because she was like, she can do it, she's got this. And I did it in the end. So You're an impressive young woman. Um and so and can you tell yet how they're working or not working? Um I've only just started on it. So I'd say there'd be an improvement, say, in the twelve weeks. So I'd have to wait and see. And before I, I, cause I, I want to, I have something I want to ask, ask you as well. You know, but, but before I do all of that period, right? So you just brought us from the age of nine and you were, you know, in primary school, you were yeah. with the GP, maybe weren't even under the correct diagnosis, then yeah. moving into the dermatology clinics and trying the topical things. It wasn't great trying yeah. tablets for a couple of years that you yeah. really didn't like. And obviously the phototherapy and, and yeah. none of them getting it fully under control and none of them was that all very stressful? I mean, did it impact on you, on your confidence or on what you would wear or on how you felt about yourself or, or, or things in, in yeah, general, Yeah, it Chris? would. Um, I'd have to like make sure my skin was covered because I hated it. It didn't look nice at all. It would so be- you were very self-conscious yeah, about it. Yeah, I was it. quite self-conscious about it, especially when it came to swimming in the summer. I My mum would go shopping with me to make sure I had the right swim suit so it wouldn't like it would cover my skin um, so you weren't looking at bikinis you were looking no. at one pieces yeah. or okay yeah all of that yeah and in primary school it was a bit weird for me to have this skin condition because people would look at me and be like oh is she sick is it contagious is something wrong with her is she going to get better and, and was that very like socially awkward as in did you feel and I don't even know if they were actually, but did you feel in your head people were looking at you and thinking, yes. yeah, okay, okay. Yeah. That's very hard. Yeah. And it was the age I was as well. Yeah. So it was a bit weird to be. You're still only 16. I mean, yeah. you seem remarkably confident in all of that. And that's a great thing. And I'm delighted yeah. that you are. But that's what we're talking about. It is hard yeah. when, when you're younger. Fiona, let me bring you in here as well. I'm sure this is a really common story that you would have that kind of associated. You have the psoriasis, but you yeah. have the stress as well. Yeah, so we see it all the time in clinic. Um, so like from generally, even when they're first, they come to us, they have their diagnosis of psoriasis. Parents and the children and teenagers are stressed. Um, you know, like that, they've been going around with these plaques. They might have scalp issues too. Um, it's probably taken a while to get into us. The stress of, you know, the, the, the embarrassment. And um, so we, like it's heartbreaking for us. And that's why we want to try and do everything we can to, you know, you would love to make it better, like cure them. But um, we try and give them the tools to manage yeah. that. So, you know, again, by empowering with education um, as a nurse, then when they're first diagnosed, we like would sit down with the parents and the child and go through, usually as may have mentioned, like the first line treatment is their topical therapy. So we kind of go explain all that, the different kind of topical steroids we use, try to find an emollient that suits their skin. We can even demonstrate like how to apply them, where to apply them. Um, and really important that they maximise the use of them, especially the emollients, as as itch isn't th the biggest issue, but it, it can they can be well, quite. Well, itchy. I'm just wondering that that your mum thought Chris initially you had nits, maybe because you're scratching your head and you're yeah. in primary school, but maybe other people would be saying, "Oh, Chris constantly has nits because she's constantly scratching mm -hmm. her head." And so yeah. there's all those yes. the stress. Is, is there a good way, Fiona, of of say Chris's mum communicating with other people about? What's Chris's condition so that people aren't thinking it's a lack of hygiene or it's contagious yeah. or those things that you've mentioned. Yeah. So I think um, if that was the case, kind of like the teacher is probably going to be a really good friend here. And um, I suppose if you could link in with the teacher and try to get a bit of support, educate the teacher yeah. and then like they could probably try and educate like your peers. Because um, like I said, it's not contagious. Like you're not unhygienic. Like it is. It's, it's a chronic condition and, you know, it can get worse and then it can get good and like that there's a lot of kind of um myths there but we try and with if the teacher can educate them and let them know that actually this is very normal 
Uh, and Fiona, is there a good way of of communicating, okay, with the peers, but also maybe the parent communicating with with the child? Because I'm sure you were having all these emotions, and I'm sure your mum was thinking, "How do I best help you?" Is there is there a good way for parents to talk to? Yeah, I guess like anything, I think we would feel really strongly or maybe like, if you, in, both of you like, yeah you, no like, I think we feel really to to strongly kids about that it. number one that you're open and honest like you don't lie to the child like you let them know like obviously age appropriate so you know depending on their age <laughs> like if you have a nine-year-old versus like a 15 year old but you know you're telling them that okay well you do have a chronic condition and you know um it can come and go and this is so depending on what treatment is so whether they're doing the topical therapies or the light treatment or whatever they're doing like explaining I think just being really honest um you know perhaps like having a family discussion, including other family members in it, just listening to their worries. Um, you know, I think, would you agree Would that have worked for you? Like, uh, Yeah, I think it would, yeah. If people knew, like it'd be quite nice to talk to people. Yeah. Because I didn't really have any friends that had my condition. And is that a bit isolating? Um, a little bit, yeah, because it was just me on my own having it and then everybody else didn't have it. And you're at an age where being a teeny bit different yeah. is hard, isn't it? Yeah. Um, I'm sure you must hear this as well, maybe. Absolutely. All the time. And I, I think, you know, we always try and tell our patients, you know, it's often hidden. There are other people in your school with this too. You and there are know. lots yeah. of adults you just don't know. Yeah. Um, yeah, because it. people don't speak about it openly. I think it's important the child knows that this and the young person knows that it's not contagious. You won't spread it. You won't pass it on. Um, that, uh, you know, it's nothing you've done or haven't done. It's you were born with beautiful eyes, brown eyes. And it's just the same thing. You were born with a tendency to get this. And constantly keeping a positive attitude with your child you know that this can be managed there are lots of people to help and also you know encouraging openness not just in the family but also in the classroom and how you know there are books you can get um, that can be p read to your child or with your child and brought into the classroom and you know telling your young person this is an opportunity to educate everyone else in your class and that's very useful um, especially in the late childhood years, t teenage years are maybe slightly different, but... Um, I know when I was a GP, we used to say when, when a, a child or a young person had a condition, we had two patients, we had the child, but we had the parent as well. You had to kind Absolutely. of treat and both the and, and help both through. Yeah. Would you have advice for parents? Because I'm sure parents are not just worried uh, about their child, but also even worried about things like treatment, worried about topical Absolutely. steroids. They've heard that they thin their skin and, and they've read things online. Uh, they're trying funny diets. They're do, you know they're doing you know they're doing yeah. all that stuff. Worried about them having to take an injection. Worried about them being on on a drug long term. All those worries. Would you have advice for parents around those kind of fears that parents must be carrying? Absolutely. I mean, you'd rather have something yourself than your child. You and any tiny thing your child has is a big problem, you know. Um, and parents are not, every single parent is, is anxious and worried about their child when they have a chronic skin condition. Um, and I think reassurance is so important, you know, telling, I always like to reassure parents and children, we have got this, we do this all the time, you know. Worry, it's my job to worry about what medication, you know, how often, it needs to be monitored and to give you the information and that information is evidence based. It's based on science. We know the safety and we know how it's done. Um, and so you want to reassure, reassure, them. absolutely. And our children and our young people are very resilient. They tolerate these medications very well and we can control this. Um, and I always like to tell people, you know, there are side effects to doing nothing. You know, and if we don't do anything and this rash, um, you know, starts to take over our, the, the young person's life and hold them back, those side effects are greater yeah. than any other side effects that are that we are And listed. just just we're coming to the end of, of this session. So I just want to ask all of you one more thing on that note. How successful are we in treatment in terms of how likely if, if a parent brings their their child to a dermatologist with psoriasis? How likely are they to get full control? It, it, it's it's pretty good now. Very isn't likely, it? yeah. We 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 have a range of medications, and we will work through them in a systematic way, depending on the extent of your disease or the impact of your disease. And we will be able to control your psoriasis so that there is minimal psoriasis. 
I mean, it's a great, it's that, a great, that's a great, era. that's a great takeaway from yeah, this yeah. For, in terms of hope. And can I, can I ask you as well, Fiona, in terms of, of like, Chris is now 16. It won't be long before she transitions to adult care. What do, do families need to know about making that transition from, from the very nurturing pediatric environment into the, the slightly, <laughs> the, slightly more choppy waters maybe yeah. of adult care? Oh, look, I suppose, again, like Maeve said, like with parents, I feel like they've been not, not only for the patient, the child, they've been on this journey too with them. And as the child transitions to an adult service, I think it can be quite hard for the parent maybe to let go mm. <laughs> almost. Um, yeah. So, you know, little things like when they're in the adult service, like, you know, usually if there's a problem or an issue, we tell the parents, we give them our numbers. If they need to call us with anything, we'll take, like as a CNS, we'll take a call. We can you know, help them, whatever's going on. Um, like if in an adult service, they won't like speak to the parents, they'll speak to like, it's not the child, you're the patient now, do you know, things like that. And, and that can be hard because like you still have a young adult, they're 18, And 19. you're still worried about them, but you're relinquishing a bit of control. And... Yeah, so there's that kind of, you know, like a parent at any stage, it's always hard to let go of it. And I think they've really held on for so long. And um, so that can be tough and, and difficult for, for the, the, the child if they have been in the child service for a long time. Yeah. For them even to have that confidence to ring themselves and to ask questions and you know so yeah. that can be that can be tricky yeah. um luckily I've, like sometimes if you're lucky enough to be in you know a children's hospital if you do transition you might get to keep your same consultant so that that's always a bonus and chris lastly i'm going to come to you and give you the last word here do you have any tips for other people who are who are young people like yourself who are going through it um i would like own it and make it like not be a big deal to yourself um, I would use the creams every day as much as possible because they can get very itchy and sore. So use them as much as possible and then don't scratch them. Scratching is a no-no. Yeah, it's not. No, don't do it. Um, it's going to hurt it. It's going to make it bleed. And then it's just not going to look nice when you scratch it. Okay, so so take ownership of it. Yeah. Don't scratch it and lash on the emotions. And also don't make it upset you. Don't make it, don't let it get overtake to. your life because once it does, you won't get away from it. Like it won't make you feel better. I think emollients are really underused. Yeah. Like, you know, as the itch isn't, but it is there. And even when you've got your plaques, like it softens the scale. It really does help with, yeah. and even like the scale build up, it does help with the itch and, you know. Yeah. I mean, studies have shown emollients alone will improve yeah. psoriasis, but I, I think, you know, the best emollient is the one you'll use. Well, that's it. And I think there, we have a, a problem with a lot of emollients is particularly for young people, you know, I mean, they're not they're cosmetically messy. elegant. And they're messy. They're messy. messy. Yeah. And, you know, you're a very busy stage in your life and, you know, trying to factor in extra time. And, that's, it is hard. and that's that thing that you said at the beginning about tailoring the treatment, treatment to, to the, the individual. Yes. To the individual, their age and their disease. Yeah. Um, Thank you all so much for this, particularly you, Chris, because I, I suspect your, yours are the words that everyone will be hanging on as much as we have experts here with Fiona and Maeve. But we do have some questions because we did ask when we were making the episode, we said to parents, what, you know, because we know people wait a long time to see a nurse practitioner or to see a, a, a dermatologist. So we yeah. asked them, what do they want us to ask you? And I'm going to ask you some of those questions now. I hope you don't mind. My son is 11 and his dermatologist has suggested a biologic therapy, but he's terrified of needles. He's the opposite of you, Chris. Mm -hmm. Do you have any suggestions as to how he might overcome this? Fiona, Maeve, would you have any suggestions? Yeah, well, obviously, if they're starting that therapy, they're in with us and um, they'll be attending like specialists. So um, we can suggest maybe linking in with the play therapist or like psychology if it was a real needle phobia to try and overcome it. Um, they can kind of go through they have different like things they do to work through try and overcome it because I guess if it's been suggested then that's what's necessary. Really, yeah. yeah, it's I necessary. Think, you know, and, these children are have chronic disease. Yeah. They, they will have he will need likely lifelong therapy. So it's important that he feels happy around needles because he will require bloods and needles for the rest of his day. So I think you have to take it really seriously yeah. and really address the needle phobia. And absolutely if it's not if it's mild, play therapy and distraction techniques particularly good in younger children. Um, he's 11, so psychology can be very helpful. And I suppose for mums, reassuring them that you can overcome phobias and children, Certainly. I know it sounds kind of sad, but children who, who tend to be children who are having needles on a regular basis, their fear level around needles decreases, doesn't it? 
I think, yeah, it can go either way. I think if they have it regularly, sometimes that can cement a phobia. But I think, you know, it's a very uh, common problem that we see and it is overcome. And everyone feels so victorious when, when it, I mean, we all get so it, excited. It, when the, it's, when it's, a, when a, it's a win. And so. it it's a win, you know, the mom, I mean, the child, yeah. we're all uh, delighted when, when we do overcome And it. I think if the treatment does, like if they are getting clearance, there's kind of a lot more buy-in yeah. then as well. Like, Absolutely. you know, they're seeing, oh, this is working, so. I was told if I filled a nylon stocking with oats and tie it to the bath tap and let the water run through and fill in the bath, it will help relieve the itch. Is it true? Might be true, <laughs> yeah. I mean, colloidal oatmeal has been shown to um, uh, allow the skin to retain water and it has some anti-inflammatory actions. So, you know, patients do report that uh, it can relieve itch. So, might, might. so some old wives tales exactly. are, There's are some yeah. have. can diet and lifestyle make a difference? My teen loves pizzas and fast foods, mm -hmm. but is this making the condition worse? Oh. Yeah, oh. Mm -hmm. well, well like, we all love pizza. Yeah, <laughs> I wouldn't say it's directly making it worse, but like any chronic condition, <clears throat> you know, I think it's always try and follow a healthy, a healthy balanced diet, diet you a know, healthy life. but there is yeah. a balance to be struck for teens that they're already at a at a at a at a disadvantage by having a difference and if all their mates are having pizza etc mm. yeah so a, look a little bit know, of of, of balance. yeah of normality moderation. like pizza might be yeah. okay sometimes yeah of course yeah of for course. everyone i mean i think <laughs> young people with psoriasis do have to be aware that you know they're psoriasis patients are more likely to have difficulties with their weight and in the future in adulthood may have more difficulties with cardiovascular or, or heart disease. So I think um, some awareness around that at a young age, you know, a, a short five to 10 minute chat in the younger years is worth hours of conversation in the adult years. So I think it's really important that we encourage them to make healthy choices around so diet good, yeah. and exercise just to to manage that situation, but equally Moderation so, yeah. is, is key. Broadly healthy yeah. focus. Exactly. Yeah. And enjoy Occasional your... Occasional pizza. Exactly. <laughs> okay. yeah. Like, um, like can, for all of us. Yeah. Yes, exactly. <laughs> like, exactly. Can swimming make psoriasis worse? I worry that the chlorine in the pool or indeed salt water will irritate the condition. I think we encourage exercise and we encourage swimming and uh, and, and getting involved in, in sports for the reasons just discussed. Um, you know, chlorine can dry out the skin, no doubt. Um, but advice for our patients is a good barrier on their psoriasis before they get into the pool and, you know, moisturise well when they get out and enjoy their exercise and go swimming. So like we said with the emollients, really using them so before and after. Yeah. You okay. So you, you can you can plan around it. To, yeah. To, okay, yeah. very good. Should I tell my child, this is a very good question, that they will have probably psoriasis for the rest of their lives? Yes, yeah, I mean, like, <laughs> maybe not use those that phrase. Yeah. Maybe don't be quite so dramatic. Yes. yes, but I mean, I think children, you know, know. children can sniff a lie at 20 oh, yeah. cases mm -hmm. and, you know, they are more resilient than we think. And, you know, we can learn a lot from children. They're very resilient and they live in the moment much better than us. Um, and I think the the way you tell it that, you know, you're likely to have, you're likely to, this disease is likely to come and go throughout your life, mm -hmm. uh, like most diseases really you know the vast majority of things and that everybody has something but again really keeping a positive attitude that we're all here to help and there's lots we can do was it a blow to you chris hearing that it was kind of a a, a lifelong condition more or less or, or was that okay um i did want it to go i've wanted it to go since i was younger and it is a little bit annoying that i'm gonna have it for the rest of my life but if i do my creams if i do my injections, I think it's going to get much better for myself. And that's what I'm hoping for. Yeah. yeah. I think as well, patients engage a lot more um, and they're more empowered if they know this is lifelong. They're much more likely to engage in in treatment. Yeah. Um, whereas telling someone you'll grow out of it, well, they'll say, I'll just wait. But that's not fair on them. You know, yeah. I have to deal with. And it's really important for like the like to have that trust between like the patient and the practitioner that they trust us. You know, because you don't want to lie to them. Yeah, so, yeah, no, you know, no. Like, I can see why someone would ask this question. It's to but protect I, yeah. them. But, but I, but I, I, I yeah. totally but, get what yeah. you're saying. My teenage daughter is really self-conscious when wearing her gym gear in school. Have you any suggestions as to how I can help her overcome this? I presume that's either shorts or a little gym skirt or whatever. So it's more exposure of limbs, etc. Et Chris, what would you say? Because you're, yeah. this is the advice that 
somebody who is the same age as you would be getting? Yeah, um, maybe wear like a top underneath it with the top over it so you kind of have stuff covering it. Oh yeah, like those rash things yeah. that people wear under it. Yeah, yes. And like a short top, so say if she's wearing one of those like small little tops, you can wear a top underneath it mm, to make yeah. it more comfier for yourself. Yeah. And also like you can wear leggings with it, but if you want to wear your shorts, maybe just wear other leggings underneath it, but make sure that you don't get too warm. Then. That's very practical advice. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm not sure I would have even thought of it. I, w- I was thinking more of the psychology end of things, but that's actually very practical advice. Yeah. Would you guys ha- have Absolutely. any good yeah. advice there? And schools are great. Yeah. Um, when you engage with schools and parents engage with schools, teachers and principals are, are you know, very on board. Very on board. And absolutely, I think. W- perhaps escalate treatment, be maybe a little bit more aggressive with her treatment if, if she's having these problems. But all the yeah, practical practices. measures you mentioned whenever, yeah. when, when you're waiting for the treatment to, to kick in. Yeah. And then letting, obviously, again, about that communication with the teacher and, you know, letting them know that they do have a chronic skin condition and that's so that they're not, so they're allowed, you know. Yeah, those. And, and should be a bit sensitive. Don't yeah, be saying, exactly. Why are you wearing, yeah. You know, yeah, exactly. the, the why are you wearing that kind of thing? Yeah, uh-huh. no, that's great, yeah. great advice. And um, will body piercings cause psoriasis to flare? And I mean, there's a big fashion now for. Yeah. I, I see my own daughter has. <laughs> I don't can't count the number of earrings. Um, <laughs> is that an issue? It can. I mean, psoriasis can um, flare due to injury. So we can see psoriasis in surgical wounds or in cuts and, and an injury like uh, as piercing. Absolutely. OK. Um, the National Psoriasis, uh, the Psoriasis Association in the UK have a very good website for teenagers. Um, uh, and, and they actually discuss body piercings and things like that on body it. It's a great website tattoos, for all those, all the things that people might be considering. Yeah. Guys, we're going to leave it there. Thank you so much to the three of you, particularly you, Chris, but also obviously Fiona and Maeve as well. Thank you so much. We really hope that was useful to you. That is our third episode in our series Beyond Expectations. So let's talk psoriasis. And we'd love to hear your comments, your feedback, and we'd love to, you to be sharing your, your, your tips, your advice and your questions online in the community out there using the hashtag So Let's Talk Psoriasis. We're spelling so P-S-O. That is our lot for today. Our next episode, our final episode in the series will be on psoriatic arthritis and our experts will be answering all your questions. I'm Dr. Kira Kelly, and I hope that you enjoyed today and found it as informative as I did. 